afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to fill out the attendance records at the back of the auditorium and also please if you would fill out the program evaluations and if you could give the CME committee any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, we would be appreciative. Uh, today I have the uh, pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Philip Lee. Dr. Lee completed his residency in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery at the University of Iowa. He is uh, board certified in both otolaryngology and uh, sleep medicine. Uh, he is in practice uh, in Mason City at the Mason City Clinic and he also is a clinical assistant professor of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery and he kindly has accepted our invitation to uh, drive down uh, I-35 today to update us on surgical advances in obstructive sleep apnea. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee. Thank you. Good morning. What a beautiful day for a drive. Um, I was asked to talk about surgical advances for obstructive sleep apnea, and in fact, there aren't a lot of things to tell you, but we'll go through what's available. Um, my day job is being, being an ENT physician, so I like to show this slide whenever I can. So we get a number of patients that will come to our cl clinic specifically saying, I've had a sleep study, I have sleep apnea, but I don't want to wear a leaf blower to bed every night. They don't want to wear a CPAP. Are there alternatives? And the answer is absolutely. And I had a patient just this morning with the same request. She's had her sleep study, moderate apnea with an apnea hypotony index of 28. She's been titrated to a pressure of 11, but chooses not to wear CPAP. And she said, what can you do for me? And the answer is very easy. It's a tracheostomy. We're going, and this is misspelled, so we won't stay long here, I'm sorry. This is a tracheostomy, and we're bypassing the upper airway. And this is curative, it's equivalent to CPAP, but it's a rare patient that truly needs this. This is rather morbid to do to people, and I've been in Mason City close to 30 years and probably done a dozen of these for sleep apnea. It's not done very often. Bottom line, though, is people don't want to necessarily wear a CPAP, and they're looking for alternatives. The, the topic for today, though, is really obstructive sleep apnea, and we're talking about an obstruction of the upper airway, and that means anywhere from where the air enters either at the nose, preferably, or the mouth, and then goes through the larynx. Once the air is in the larynx and the trachea, the airway is supported by cartilage and doesn't collapse. But the upper way, airway is prone to collapse and can lead to obstructions, snoring, and sleep apnea. The best analogy I can give you is consider sucking and blowing air through a rubber tubing. And depending on the size of that tube and the structural characteristics of the tube and how hard you may suck, it can collapse. And that's exactly what happens in sleep apnea. Now, <clears throat> if we talk about surgical options, we have really four choices. One, we can bypass the upper airway, and that's a tracheostomy. Again, not many people need this. We can enlarge the airway, and that would mean a mandibular maxillary advancement. And we're literally enlarging the airway. It's a major surgery with a fair amount of morbidity, and that's not done very often. We can change the airway a bit by suspending the tongue and pulling it forward, and I'll show you some things about that. And we can reduce the size of certain structures in the airway, that being the tongue, the tonsils, the palate, and the uvula. But the treatment of choice for sleep apnea is CPAP. It's effective, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's non-invasive. And that should be our primary goal, is to get people on CPAP. And for, for those individuals where we vary from that, we should have a logical reason to do so. If we consider sleep, sleep in a word is restorative. We don't function well without it. There are a number of sleep deprivation studies. We don't have time or interest to go into them today, and we don't need to think about them because we all know that if we don't have a good night's sleep, we don't function well. Looked at another way, sleep is a cost we pay for living. Consider the fact that we spend probably close to a third of our lives asleep. And imagine, if you will, what we could accomplish if we could stay awake 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, that wouldn't be a pretty sight, but uh, uh, we need sleep, and without it, we don't function well. So the single most common cause of daytime sleepiness is uh, diagnosis code 307.44, which is behaviorally in 
induced insufficient sleep. And literally, people don't get enough sleep. How much sleep? Probably seven to eight hours is where we should be. But when you consider life's demands, often that doesn't happen. Our job, though, in these sleep apnea patients is trying to make sure that the sleep they get is good sleep. And sleep ap apnea it is disruptive to your sleep. So if we look at um, some definitions of sleep, uh, sleep can be defined as a complex behavioral and physiologic process, a reversible state of perceptual disengagement, usually eyes closed, postural recumbence, and divided into two distinct uh, states. Now, N1 and N2, N3 are non-REM sleep, and then REM sleep, and I've listed sort of a general percentage of the amount of time we would spend in these levels throughout the night. Now, N1 is a light level of sleep, and some people would call it a transitional stage from wake to sleep. We're easily aroused from that level. N1 and N2 together are considered lighter levels of sleep, and you can see that we spend over half our night in these lighter levels. N3 and REM sleep are the deeper levels of sleep that we need to get into to feel re refreshed and restored the next morning. Now, as we get into the deeper levels of sleep, and specifically in REM sleep, our muscles are paralyzed except the diaphragm and intercostal muscles so we can breathe. But everything else is paralyzed, so if our airway has a tendency to collapse as we get into the deeper levels of sleep and REM, the airway collapses and we have, uh, we have a cessation of airflow. With that, with that, there's an oxygen desaturation which very quickly our brain senses and then arouses us from a deeper to a lighter level of sleep to resume proper breathing. So you may spend, with sleep apnea, you may spend adequate hours in bed, but you don't get into and stay into these deeper levels where we f truly feel refreshed. So sleep apnea is simply a cessation of breathing with sleep. Most of it is obstructive, perhaps 90% and more of sleep apnea is obstructive, and that's what we're interested in today. In central apnea, the uh, respiratory centers in the brain don't tell us to breathe. There's just no effort. And generally, these are associated with other uh, health issues, especially congestive heart failure, COPD, and then certain degenerative uh, conditions of the brain. Now, the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, number one is snoring, and that generally is why patients are in our office, and it's usually the wife saying that if you don't do something about my husband snoring, he's not coming to the bedroom tonight. <coughs> there are witnessed apneas. That means that the bed partner is aware of periods where the patient quits breathing. They're restless. Every time they quit breathing, uh, there's an arousal. They generally get to a different position to resume breathing, so they're restless, and then they're tired throughout the day. So these are just some percentage of, of people who snore, and it gets worse as we get older, and guys, this is one thing we can do better than the ladies. Sleep apnea, this is a commonly uh, used percentage as to how many people may have sleep apnea, both men and women. I was recently at an annual update uh, put on by the University of Pennsylvania and University of Can California, San Francisco. And one speaker said these numbers are way underestimating and perhaps the number for men should be closer to 25% and women 10%. So it is, a, it is a significant problem. So what? Well, snoring leads to social implications. People don't sleep together. Um, it's, it can be a problem. In general, though, snoring is not detrimental to your health. On the other hand, sleep apnea keeps us from getting a good night's sleep, and on the short term, we have a poor night of sleep. Just a couple uh, uh, statistics. Uh, um, uh, patients with sleep apnea seem to have far more accidents, and in fact, a third of the fatal accidents may be related to obstructive sleep apnea. Long term, sleep apnea leads to hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. And when we think about heart disease, I've mentioned if, if you have an episode where you have an apnea or a hypopnea, there's an oxygen desaturation. The brain senses this and arouses us from a deeper to a lighter level of sleep. And with that arousal, there are some catecholamines. Adrenaline, noradrenaline are put into the system. 
and think of your heart muscle in a relatively hypoxic state and then have adrenaline running around. And this is probably why most of these people get into atrial fibrillation. So 50% of adult patients with hypertension or coronary artery disease have obstructive apnea and it's not the hypertension or coronary artery disease that causes the apnea, it's the other way around. And similarly with stroke patients. So how do we diagnose this? Well, we need a sleep study and generally this has been in the sleep lab over the years. Insurance companies for cost reason, reasons are pushing towards home sleep studies. As we consider this, a type 1 test is the in-lab standard sleep study. Type 2, 3, and 4 are home studies. A type 2 test is equivalent to an in-lab study. It's everything is obtained that you would get in the in-lab. Type 3, we get four channels, uh, airflow, respiratory effort, heart rate, and oxygen. And a type 4, you get one channel, either oximetry or apnea hypopnea index. The thing to understand is in this level three or level four test, there's no EEG, EOG, or EMG. And the significance of that is you don't know whether the patient slept. And they may not have slept at all, or they may have slept very poorly. And in that instance, you may underestimate the problem. If they slept well, it will give you a good in, uh, estimate of what's going on. So in lab, that's the gold standard test. We measure EEG, EMG, EOG, EKG, oximetry, airflow, effort, and leg movements. They can be expensive depending on what's available. You might have quite a weight. And then does it truly represent a night at home sleeping? And many times patients will come in and say, wow, I couldn't sleep there. You ask me to come into a room that isn't my familiar bedroom, you attach all these wires, and I know there's a technician in and out all night. So does it truly represent a home sleep? And that can be debated. Bottom line is that's the best we have. Now, home studies are less expensive. People question their accuracy, and I don't think there's an accuracy issue. I think we have to understand we just have to understand that in the type three and type four, we don't know whether the patient is asleep or not. And so we're, we're talking about respiratory events per recording time and not sleep time. And if the patient did not sleep well or did not sleep at all, uh, you generally will underestimate this. And for that reason, this should not be done to rule out sleep apnea. These are, the home studies are best done in that patient that based on history and physical findings, you have a high likelihood of believing this patient has sleep apnea and you're going to confirm it. But it should not be done to rule out sleep apnea. Now as far as who are you testing, <clears throat> at a meeting I heard an anecdotal report of a trucking company that decided to do a home sleep test on all their drivers with a body mass index greater than 35. And that's a reasonable assessment, a reasonable idea, because as you get over BMI of 35, there's a fair chance that you have sleep apnea. And initially they found a fair number of people that had sleep apnea, and these drivers were then taken off the road until they were compliant on CPAP. After about six months, nobody was having a positive test. And come to find out, the truckers would be talking as they drive and at, at, uh, at uh, uh, truck stops and, and realize that they would be taken off the road. And so they were having their wife or somebody else do the sleep test and it was coming out negative. So you have to know who you're testing. And then, as I mentioned before, with congestive failure, COPD, or certain uh, central nervous system disease, you may have more central sleep apnea. And we shouldn't be testing those people at home. So we, we do a number of home sleep studies in Mason City, mainly as insurance uh, drives it. Um, uh, and we're not here to talk about that today, but I, I do like for a screening test to do an overnight pulse oximetry. And this is clearly abnormal in that we have about 20% of the time where the patient's saturation is less than 90%. We have these cyclical uh, desaturations that probably, especially here, here, and here represent REM sleep. 
But the other piece of information you can glean from overnight pulse oximetry is you look at this index, and this is the oxygen desaturation index. And, and each time there is a desaturation of four percentage points or more, that's called an oxygen desaturation event. And the index is the number of times that happens per hour. And what you'll find is that um, this oxygen desatur desaturation index, which is 40 on this one, is very close to your apnea hypopnea index if you actually do a sleep study. This can be a useful test, especially for that individual that is in complete denial and thinks they have nothing wrong with them, so you can show them something objectively before you proceed to a sleep study. So an apnea is defined as a 90% reduction of airflow for at least 10 seconds. They can be obstructive, mixed, or central. Most are obstructive. This week's diagnosis or de definition of hypopnea is a 30% reduction in airflow with a 3% desaturation or an arousal. And I say this week because the hypopnea definition seems to change almost monthly. Ten years ago, it was a 50% reduction in airflow and a 4 percentage drop in oxygen saturation. And uh, people keep changing these. It doesn't seem to make a lot of difference, but just remember, for Medicare purposes, they demand a four percentage point desaturation. So your lab needs to look for four percentage desaturation on the hypopnea if you expect Medicare to pay for your CPAP. So we look then for the apnea hypopnea index. That's the number of times per hour there's an apnea or a hypopnea. And zero to four is normal. Five to 14 would be mild sleep apnea. 15 to 30, moderate greater than 30 is severe. So what causes this? More than anything, it's obesity. More than anything, it's obesity. And then we look at the upper airway, and we need to think in terms of the nose, the tongue, and then the pharynx or the throat. <clears throat> so this is a BMI chart, which stands for Body Mass Index, and that's calculated by taking your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. Much easier to look at a table like this. In any regard, uh, if you're in the green, you're healthy. Blue, you're underweight. Yellow, overweight, obese, and extremely obese. And we can leave this here just for a moment so you can see where you might be. But we should be in the green area. And a weight change of 10% weight loss can reduce your apnea hypopnea index by about a fourth. And if you gain 10%, uh, you'll go up by about a third. So we also need to think about the nose if we want to talk about alternatives to CPAP. And we think about the nasal septum in the midline of the nose. And you don't need to be an ENT specialist to look in the nose. As you see people look with your otoscope in the nose, 70% of us will have a deflection one way or the other. And that doesn't mean 70% of people need a nose operation. But in that patient where clearly the septum is de deviated and they talk about obstruction on one side that's continuous, that patient may benefit from uh, nasal septal surgery. Most of the issues, though, in the nose have to do with the turbinates. And on the side wall of the nose, there are three mounds of tissue called the turbinates. And these tissues warm and humidify the incoming air. And there's a thing called the nasal cycle. And at any time, if you stop to think about it, one side of your nose will seem more open than the other. Overall, you feel like you should be moving adequate airway through the air through the nose, but one side is more stuffy than the other. And that side that is a bit occluded or stuffy is in a period of rest. The turbinates are somewhat swollen, and the other side is open. And that goes back and forth anywhere from about a 20-minute to four-hour cycle throughout the day. And uh, when we look in the nose and we see these turbinates are generous in size, we know that as we lay down, these will get bigger. Um, we also consider polyps, which can be located uh, um, on the side wall of the nose uh, uh, in the middle meatus here and the superior meatus. Uh, we think of tumors, which are really quite rare in the nose. and then. One can consider adenoids, and yet adenoids generally have gone away by the time we're 12 years of age. When we consider the mouth and the throat, uh, the tongue is a huge part of this. 
And in measure, there's no way to measure the tongue, but in general, you should be able to lay a piece of paper on the lower teeth in your mind. And if the tongue is protruding above that, it's too big. And as you look back into the throat without pushing the tongue down, you should be able to see the palate, the uvula, and the tonsils. And if we consider a, a side view, the tongue is a muscle, and as we put on weight, fatty tissue literally infiltrates the tongue. And Dr. Richard Schwab at the University of Pennsylvania has done some wonderful MRI pictures showing how the tongue enlarges because of fatty infiltration. And then especially if we are on our back, the tongue then falls against the back wall of the throat and is a big part of the obstruction. So this is another way of uh, sort of a quantifying tongue position and it, it's in relation to how big the tongue is and what you can see in the back. And generally, again, you should be able to see the palate, the uvula, and the tonsils. If you can see roughly half the tonsils, we consider that a Friedman class two. Uh, class three, we can just see the free margin of the palate, and a class four, you see nothing back there. And these patients have a big tongue, and that's a big part of the reason why they have snoring and sleep apnea. So just a classification of the tonsil size. Zero means the tonsils are gone. Four mean they're touching. One, they're within the confines of the tonsillar pillars. And then two or three are gradations in between. So how do we treat this? Number one is CPAP. And again, CPAP is the treatment of choice. Uh, there are not many people that cannot use CPAP there's a lot that will not use CPAP. And part of our job is visiting with these patients and talking about the long-term risks. And, and I counted up the last 35 patients that I started on CPAP, and actually 27 of them were meeting Medicare compliance, which means they're using it at least four hours a night, uh, five out of seven nights, or 70% of the nights. So that's not horrible, but still that leaves a group that's untreated. So weight loss is huge. Difficult problem, but weight loss is huge. And for many of our patients, we send them to the hospital dietitian to at least get an idea of what they maybe should aim for from a caloric intake. What doesn't work is that you give them this pep talk that they need to lose some weight, and they go home for three or four days and starve themselves, and then it, it all comes back on. So it's weight loss over time. Position therapy. Most people do better on their sides. The back is the worst position for snoring and sleep apnea for most people. And, and the easiest way to get people on their side is to make a pocket on the back of their pajama top and put a tennis ball there. Silly, but very effective. They will not sleep on their back if they have a tennis ball sitting there. Um, we're going back to our nose picture again. Um, for some, it's appropriate to straighten the septum. But when we think about the nose, uh, the nose isn't the place where we snore, but if the nose is congested, it takes more effort, there's more resistance, it takes more effort, and it causes the pharyngeal tissues to collapse. So things like nasal steroid sprays, Flonase, Nasonex, Nasocort can be helpful. Antihistamines, decongestants, although I don't think we want to keep people on de decongestants all the time. Singular can help open up the nose. And then we can talk about surgical intervention to this lower turbinate. And when we consider airflow patterns through the nose, 90% of the airflow comes past this lower turbinate. If you look in some old textbooks in the 1950s and before, they used to take a scissor and cut that lower turbinate out of there. Those people all breathed well, but eventually they were left with a dry, crusted nose. So that's not what you want to do. But today we have a variety of ways of shrinking the turbinates, some in the operating room, some in the office. Nothing is permanent. I tell people it'll last five to 10 years. But opening up the nose can be a significant help for snoring and sleep apnea. Max Air nose cones, these are little devices that you can buy. Um, they're $22 a pair, and you literally wear these at night, and they keep the nose open, and they can be quite effective. This is what they look like, maxairnosecones.com. I don't own that company, but uh, it's a nice way. They're sort of like putting a Breathe Right strip on, I think. The advantage of these is that you can reuse them. And many patients that would use a Breathe Right stripper every night, they get some skin irritation after a time. Mandibular advancement devices. These are devices made by our dental colleagues. And it looks like a, uh, a um, 
tooth guard per potentially that football players would wear and it fits on the upper and lower teeth and it's made such that when you wear it, it pulls the lower jaw forward in relation to the upper jaw and as it does so, it pulls the tongue forward. And for mild to moderate apnea, that would mean an apnea hypotony index of 30 or less, this can be considered a first line treatment for sleep apnea. Now it's not without some potential side effects, specifically people um, can complain of some teeth pain will complain of some teeth pain with these. Some people complain over time that their occlusion changes and that's not surprising. It's sort of like wearing braces. We're pulling hard enough on the teeth that they may change a bit. And some people will get some temporomandibular joint pain with this. But the idea is we're gonna pull the lower jaw and tongue forward and they can be very effective. And even in that severe apneic patient, if they're not wearing CPAP, this is better than doing nothing. Many dentists do this. You have to find which dentists are interested and um, this can be a helpful, uh, helpful alternative. So tonsillectomy can be a help for sleep apnea in those patients that have enlarged tonsils. This is the operation that we began doing. Uh, I first saw when I was a second year resident at the University of Iowa in the spring of 1983 and it's the UPP where we would trim off a portion of the palate the uvula and take out the tonsils. It was a good operation for snoring. It was somewhat helpful for sleep apnea. And it's not a horrible idea, but at the time we didn't understand the significance of the tongue size. We didn't understand that we needed to address the nose. We didn't understand the significance of obesity. So in and of itself, it's probably not very helpful for sleep apnea, but it is an alternative. One of the negatives is that it often leaves this dense scar band, dense stenotic scar band here, and uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's not done very often. Now when you consider the tongue, there's a couple things we can do to it. We can suspend it and we can reduce the size of it. And this shows a, um, a procedure that is made by the, a repose company, and literally a screw is put submucosally and in, in, uh, drilled into the inner aspect of the jaw and from that screw comes this suture and this suture is uh, threaded um, through the tongue and pulled forward and pulling the tongue forward. I've never done this I've, as I've talked to colleagues that do this. I think the, um, the difficulty is you're putting suture against soft tissue and initially I think it can be helpful but over time that suture will saw through the soft tissue and so the, the long-term uh, success is not as good as we would hope. This is an operation where we might make an incision just on the, uh, on the mandible here and make a window in the mandible and this window then uh, has the attachment of the genioglossus muscle. The genioglossus muscle comes from the tongue and inserts on the mandible and it's one of the major dilators of the, of the uh, pharynx. And so the idea is we would make this uh, window of bone with the attached genioglossal muscle, pull it forward and then put a screw to secure it. And it's more impressive on pictures than it is in actually doing it. And if you do it, getting that piece of bone just right so you include that tendon for the genioglossus muscle and then not getting it dis disconnected as you do the operation is somewhat difficult, but great pictures, but it doesn't help a great deal. Now we can reduce the size of the tongue and this is something we do a fair amount of in conjunction with say that UPP operation I just showed you. And this is a needle electrode that's put into the base of the tongue. It delivers a radio frequency level of energy at about 48 degrees centigrade. And this is put into the tongue and generally we would do four positions at a time. There's a limit to how much you can do at one time in that there is some compensatory swelling in the first 24 to 48 hours that can actually lead to airway obstruction. So this is a stage procedure and you might do this two or three times and it really does reduce the size of the tongue. And what happens right around this electrode, there's a zone probably uh, three millimeters in diameter where there is necrosis of tissue. So you get reduction in the tongue volume and then this fills with scar tissue that tends to stiffen the tongue. A useful operation but somewhat limited because 
it takes several uh, several stages to make this work. Wrong way. So another way of reducing the tongue is literally to make an incision on the dorsum of the tongue and take out the central portion of the tongue. Now the two lines we have here roughly represent the neurovascular bundle coming into the tongue, that being the hypoglossal nerve and the lingual artery. And we need to stay medial to those, but this is a reasonable thing to do to reduce the size of the tongue. But it's fairly morbid and they hurt for a while and um, it does work, and that's why they need to wear CPAP more than these operations. This is a maxillomandibular osteotomy, and we're literally, in this picture, it just shows that we're dividing the mandible, but in most instances, one would divide the mandible and the maxilla and advance them. This is done by our oral surgeon colleagues. It's very effective, but it's a major operation, and uh, a fair amount of morbid side effects uh, with some facial numbness after this operation, so it's not done very often. <clears throat> and this would show after a mandibular advancement what you might expect. So what I was asked to talk about, what is new? And this is really what's new, and we'll go through this quickly. Um, upper airway stimulation. And this was printed, uh, this was a study, and this was... Uh, in the uh, no, January 9th, 2014 New England Journal of Medicine. This was the study. And the idea is, as I've told you, we, with sleep apnea, we have upper airway obstruction. Treatment of choice is CPAP, but there are a group that choose not to or will not wear their CPAP. So the idea was that we would plant, implant um, a device just below the collarbone about the size of a uh, pacemaker and one wire electrode then goes between the third and fourth ribs and senses the movement of the intercostal muscles as we begin a respiration and then the second electrode comes up to the hypoglossal nerve which stimulates the tongue and the tongue moves forward. Um, this is uh, turned on at night when the patient goes to sleep and stop during the day. And it can actually be titrated to how much you stimulate the tongue during a sleep study to get to the adequate, um, adequate response. So this was studied over a number of years and ultimately um, this was called the STAR trial and there were 126 patients that went, underwent this and this was what was printed then in the January 9th New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. Uh, later in the spring of 2014, this was approved by the FDA, and now there have been 150 implants further done around the United States and Europe, and, and it seems to be quite useful, and this may be better than anything we, we have to offer. Um, again, we only would consider those patients that are intolerant of CPAP. If they're willing to wear CPAP, that should be the treatment. Now, the limitation is less than a BMI of 32. And for those that you see patients and think about this, that's not a very big patient. And so this is not an obese patient by any means, um, but uh, um, it, it, it's felt to be appropriate for somebody with an apnea potent index between 20 and 50. So that's a fairly w w wide range and fairly severe apnea, but they just can't be too big. So um, sleep study is done, the implant is done, and then at a month uh, you begin using this, and then there will be another sleep study where you actually titrate how much you stimulate, and then the patients wore this for a year, and this is all part of the study group. And then at a year, the first 46 that responded to this were, were um, um, divided into a group of 23 that would continue, and 23 that did not. And uh, then one week later, there was a, a second study in that group that, that the implant was turned off. And, and not surprising, they were back to their usual level. So again, this is just shows the idea. Um, some of the uh, demographics of the patients, mainly men, and this is the outcome. On average, 
the apnea hypotony index dropped from 29 to 9. The oxygen and desaturation index dropped from 25 to 7.4. And then these are two uh, um, tests used to, uh, well, e Epworth sleepiness scale, you've probably all heard of that. It's sort of a silly little thing, but there are eight questions uh, situations and it asks you how likely you would fall asleep and you can put zero no chance up to three where you would likely fall asleep and so anytime that number is nine or greater that's considered abnormal and on these patients they went from an epper sleepiness scale of 11 down to six and then this FOSQ stands for functional outcome of sleep questionnaire and and they improve their sleep with this so this again is the group baseline um, month 12 sleep study showing a nice response and then that randomized therapy withdrawal trial. The group that continued with their implant did well and those that didn't uh, um, get back almost to their uh, initial level. So th this is what's new and um, uh, one implant was removed at the patient's request. One was uh, one patient died of unrelated heart disease, uh, but out of 126, 124 are still wearing it, so that's, that's quite good. Um, again, the FDA has now approved this, and, and um, this is from Inspire Company, which is a division of Medtronics out of the Twin Cities, and they're looking for centers around the country to do this. We're hoping to start doing this in Mason City within the next six months. They're looking for centers that will do many per year rather than many centers that will do one or two per year. And so um, this is something to keep your eye on. And this just shows then uh, looking with a flexible scope first at the behind the palate and then at the base of the tongue. And this isn't a patient with sleep apnea. You see there's no airway here and very little here at the base of the tongue. And when they're stimulated, it has pushed the tongue forward as we would expect, but this was a surprisingly uh, nice result in that it pulled the palate forward also. And the thought is that the palatoglossus muscle, um, which is the anterior tonsillar pillar, is obviously goes, that muscle then goes into the tongue. And as we're pulling the tongue forward through the palatoglossus muscle, we're pulling the palate forward also. So this is what's new, and I would leave you with the idea that your patients with sleep apnea should be on CPAP. Everything I've told you about is second best, but for those patients that refuse to wear their CPAP, any of these things are generally better than nothing.